And we've also moved significantly into decidedly England here. So let's just jump right in. And we're going to talk about a number of people, John Dunn, Amelia Lanyer, Ben Johnson, and William Shakespeare. So we're going to cover them all today. Um, some of them are actually quite short, like John Dunn here. So John Donne is a um, 17th century poet. Pretty much all the people we're looking at here are 17th century. Lanyer and Shakespeare kind of cross from the 16th into 17th. Um, but John Donne is actually, in addition to being a very important 17th century poetry, if you're familiar with him, he's a metaphysical poet. But also, he weighs in on environmental issues with this from what's called the second anniversary. I talked about this before, just as in past in passing, but here's John, here is um, um, him talking about the significance of the earth, the world, the earth is but a carcass, thou art fed by it, but as a worm that carcass bred. And why shouldst thou, poor worm, consider more when this world would grow better than before, than those thy fellow worms do think upon that carcass's last resurrection. resurrection. Forget this world, forget the earth, and scarce think of it as of old clothes cast off a year ago. So, you know, Lynn White Jr. makes that argument that there's a danger in Christianity because you'll see the earth as sort of secondary and unimportant because you have your mind on a metaphysical realm. You might say, yeah, but did people actually think that? Well, here we are, 17th century. Uh, John Donne is exactly saying that. He said, forget this world. Why? Because after the fall, what we saw in the beginning of Genesis, when you know Adam and Eve sinned, the earth and everything on it is now going to die. So it's a dying carcass. What do we live on? According to Donne, this planet is a carcass. It's dead. It's dying. Don't think about its last resurrection. But hey, that's a really interesting point, and we're going to see it even today with Amelia Lanyard. There were some radical thinkers, Christian thinkers. We're going to meet one next um, class with, with um, uh, John Milton, who were thinking about that. Let me, let me just flesh that out. They were saying that maybe the earth will be resurrected too. So the end of time is going to come. Jesus is going to come back to parousia, of the second coming. And what most people thought, what John Donne thought is the only thing on the planet that can be resurrected is human beings who believe in Jesus. No animals can be resurrected. The planet itself is going to burn. All plants are going to die. Only a very select group of life faithful Christians get to be um, taken off of the planet. And that's how it's imagined. At the, very, at the end of time, there'll be a whole room full of people like this, and suddenly oh, half the class will disappear. What happened? They've been sort of, you know, transported, kind of like on Star Trek, off this planet into heaven, and everyone else here will have to die. Milton and others are beginning to talk about the carcass's last resurrection, that the earth might be resurrected too, that all animals, all plants might be resurrected too. So it's an interesting passage because as far as what Dunn himself is saying, it's not very good environmentally. It's an interpretation of Christianity that says the earth isn't very important at all. Think of it, as he says here in the last line, like old clothes that you threw off a year ago. Think of it as a carcass. You're like a worm eating, living on a carcass. That's bad from an environmental point of view. But coming on the scene now are other Christian thinkers, and one of them is John Milton, who says, well, maybe not. Maybe the earth can be resurrected. Maybe it can be saved. Maybe this way of thinking about it is just wrong. And we're going to see directly with our next writer, um, Amelia Lanyer, another innovation here. And she's really important. So writing at the same time, Amelia Lanyer, description of Cookham, which is what you read in the syllabus. But before doing that, did you find these um, boring, the readings that we've recently been doing? Let me select. So what I'm talking about there by early modern readings, the readings for this week, the readings. So John Donne, Amelia Lanyer, Ben Johnson, William Shakespeare, um, and for next week, um, John Milton, did you find them interesting? Um, I'm curious if anyone said they found them utterly fascinating. They are utterly fascinating. I don't know what you thought of them, though. But um, let's see how you're responding. 
So I like to get 500 and there we are. So a little boring. Yeah, I think that's 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 fair enough. Um, basically boring. Well, I'm glad that the, the majority of people, um, the, the majority of the groups, respondents found them a little boring because that's fair enough. And hey, for the 38 people, yes, I'm in your camp. They are utterly fascinating. Um, 50 people excruciatingly boring. I'm sorry. Um, someone just changed their mind. Now 49 people. Ah, now three more people. Um, sorry, I uh, I get that. But look, you know, I said it before with the uh, with the classicals. I didn't select these because they were the most interesting. I could have selected things, and this poll would have been very different. But I selected them because they're most important. And done is really important because it reveals those two perspectives. And the next person we're going to see here, Amelia Lanier, is very important. Um, and an interesting read too, I think, but interesting in lots of ways, Amelia Lanier. So you may have heard of Amelia Lanier. Um, some people speculate that she is Shakespeare's dark lady. So if you've read Shakespeare's sonnets, you know that they're principally addressed to two people. Uh, some are addressed to one person, some are addressed to this other person. One is this very um, attractive young man, which Shakespeare likes to write to, and the other is his dark lady. There are a series of sonnets called the Dark Lady Sonnets. Um, is Amelia Lanier Shakespeare's dark lady? Well, we will absolutely never know. Um, people speculate and scholars go back and forth, but we just don't know. But let's just speculate for a moment that she was, and it's, it is possible. Um, it's really fascinating because Shakespeare scripts her as this seductress, right? So she's in the tradition of Pandora. Remember, we saw with Hesiod, Pandora brings all the sin into the world, and Eve, Eve introduces sin into the world, and then typically the way, you know, Genesis is imagined, she seduces Adam. So it's the seduction thing again and again, either from the Greco-Roman or Judeo-Christian tradition. Shakespeare buys right into that. His dark lady is this seductress, and he is incredibly passive aggressive and actively aggressive toward her because of it, because he feels scorned by her. The irony here is that Amelia Lanier is a proto feminist. And it's just such an interesting thing to think about because, you know, if she is the dark lady, and this is not an environmental thing, it's just something worth noting. Um, he's committing this incredible violence toward this person epistemologically. In other words, epistemology is how we know what we know. How you know what you know about the dark lady, this horrible representation as the scripted seductress is something that Shakespeare is forcing on her. He's portraying her, and as a writer, he has enormous power to do that, and look what he's doing is this, this horrible thing to her. Um, and Great irony, the great irony here is if she is the dark lady, she is one of the first proto feminists in the Western tradition and certainly in the English tradition. So, so how bad is that? So you take someone who is rescripting the way we imagine women, and she's and, and she will in other works, not what we're reading here, but she will actually take Owen and Eve and say, This is wrong, what's been done. Um, and yet Shakespeare sees her in this incredibly simplistic, pejorative, and incredibly unflattering way. So a um, couple things about her. So she is um, of a social group that she was uh, wealthy enough to be involved with um, the court, but she didn't come from a lot of money. So at a very young age, I think I have this right, it could be slightly wrong, but I think she was 17 when she was basically sold off to become uh, an official mistress. So um, Henry Carey, who was in his 40s at the time, had a wife and children, but it was okay in this time to have an official mistress. In fact, it was sort of negotiated, and she became that. So you know, you could see why there's the making of a feminist here, because getting forced into that position, if you have an intelligent, thoughtful person, and Amelia Lanier was, and Amelia Lanier is a new group of women coming on the scene because she's educated, she can do things like read Latin, and that opens up the world of Christianity and Judaism because 
the Bible that most people read, it was certainly read um, as the primary Catholic Bible for, for hundreds of years, was the Vulgate Bible, which is in Latin. So typically, most people didn't have access to that except wealthy men who were taught to read Latin. But now you have people coming on the scene like Lanyer who can read Latin and interpret the Bible for herself. Also, fascinating thing, and again, you know, to diminish her the way Shakespeare did is just so striking because it's been argued, and I buy the argument, that she is the first professional woman writer in England and maybe one of the first professional writer, women writers in, in Europe. And that's via something called patronage. So we've encountered this already in the sense that we've seen like Michelangelo. And how does an artist or a writer make money up into during this period? Well, you don't do it by selling books. So even people like Ben Johnson, we're going to get to directly today, he actually sells books. He actually wrote Shakespeare's, or compiled Shakespeare's first folio. But that's not how you made money. What you did is you found a wealthy patron. So someone like Michelangelo actually has the church as a patron, a lot of wealthy people as a patron. And as a consequence, they pay you for work. So Michelangelo's David, someone paid him to do that. And, you know, if you're very good, you have a very good patron. The fascinating thing about that system is it's shot through with patriarchy in the sense that patronage is always men getting money from men, male artists or writers getting money from male patrons. That's the way it always has worked. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, any of the writers who come before here who are significant, that's how it works. It's an all-male system. What makes Lanyard different is that first she is a woman herself and she finds a woman who is wealthy to become her patron. And in doing that, she exploits the patronage system, which is the only way, virtually the only way an artist can, you know, make a living at this time. And she does it in a way that's consistent with her own beliefs, which are, you know, they are feminist beliefs. We don't know of anyone else who did this before or successful at doing it the way that um, Amelia Lanyard did. And also, I put these two, I could have split this into two slides, but look at that first sentence again. You know, she was in a system where she didn't have have access to money that she had to become, you know, an official mistress to to live in the world. But she found a way to support herself um, the way that artists always had. So, yeah, if she was the dark lady, boy, is Shakespeare selling her short. Um, Cookham, which we read, which we read is in the reader, the description of Cookham was written for Lanyard's patron, which is Margaret Clifford. And it describes a community of women, which we will call a homosocial group. So what do I mean by that? Well, Margaret Clifford actually lives on this estate, Cookham, and she is there. What you'll find interesting when you read it is, and if you haven't read it, look for this, there are only women in this text. So you could see Lanyard doing this. And again, Lanyard is clever and, you know, an activist. Um, we call that a homosocial group, and that's principally been focused on uh, before this time, or you would see it with men, at least that's what we talked about. So it's not homosexual in the sense that we're not talking about sexuality once, but we're talking about a group of all, a social group composed of all one gender, all male, all female. So this is an all female group, a homosocial group, and men don't have a role in this. And that's an interesting thing to think about because men who have always done the writing have always either written all about men so um, or um, the only significant people are men or the other thing and Shakespeare is a good example of what we just saw with the dark lady if they do include women they have full control over the representation of them they can be as nasty or as horrible as they want regardless of the historical character that the, the book may have been written about so anyhow um Already, I think you're getting the idea, Len, you're an interesting person. And we could focus on her from a feminist perspective, too. And we kind of are here. Anyhow, getting into the environmental significance of it. The description of Cookham is generally called a country house poem. And we're going to see another one in a few minutes with Ben Johnson. Why these are important, this is the beginning of what we think of as nature writing today. So if you're familiar like with Wordsworth as daffodils or something, when did all that begin? It began here, which makes 
you know, um, Len, you're even more fascinating because if you're raising the if you're raising the question, when did modern nature writing begin in the West, in in English literature, for example? Well, you may go back to Amelia Lanier, um, but just to clarify something here, it's called country house poem, but that is not accurate. It's really more accurately called a country estate poem. So keep that in mind. That's something you could show up on an exam or something. And why is that? Because the focus is not on the house, but on the estate, or the estate or the surrounding environment. So already, you know, looking at what Lanyard's doing here, that's important, right? Because it's not anthropocentric, at least in the, it is kind of, and I'll explain that in a minute, but not in the sense that it focuses on the house, what people are doing in the house and all that. That's not in this text. I think you'll find one mention of the house kind of in passing, I think it's line 18. But otherwise, the whole thing is about the environment, the environment surrounding the house, which is why I, you know, make the argument it has a um, a claim on being the first true nature writing in a modern sense. And again, that goes. I hope you've seen lecture number nine. That goes to what I suggested there that this is the early modern period in a sense, not just the Renaissance, but modernity is coming on the scene here. And Amelia Lanier is 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 greatly helping that happen. Um, the poem that we're going to read next by Ben Johnson is called To Penshurst. So if we're looking at the very beginning, you know, which has the claim on being the first, um, it's going to be one of these two poems. The fact is, Cookham was written first. But Ben Jonson had to Penshurst published first. So, you know, which is the first then for the as far as the world was concerned, Johnson's was, but then if we scholars actually look at it, we realize Amelia Lanyard beat him that to that by a number of years. Just as a like kind of a teaser here for what's coming, so that you know, this country estate poem genre, which we're going to look at with um, Cookham and also Penshurst, died off a few decades later with the Pon Appleton House, which we're going to look at, I think, next lecture, um, and the rise of loco descriptive literature. And we'll see that. You don't have to know that for now, but just know that this is where it begins, modern nature writing, and it will, will die off and won't die off. It'll morph into something else pretty soon. Um, Pastoral, we know, is generally, past, interest in pastoral or explosion of pastoral literature and art often happens when there's um, something happening environmentally. And there's an explosion of interest in pastoral at this period of time. And why is that? Well, as I mentioned before, you know, population of London is growing from uh, probably tenfold from the year 1500 to 1700, huge population explosion, all sorts of problem in the city. What I talked about in lecture nine, uh, this major air pollution problem becomes the first true fossil fuel economy on the planet. And while all that's happening, people are reacting by writing pastoral. And in that sense, Cookham is part of this pastoral explosion, although she doesn't use traditional pastoral motifs, but she is consciously aware of, like Virgil, for example, and we'll see directly, because you know, because she can read Latin, remember, so she's no doubt read the first, I'm sure she's read the first eclogue, which we've read, um, and she read it in Latin to boot, and understood it, as you'll see. Um, quite an interesting reading of it, really. Um, and how is that well, remember in Virgil's first eclogue, the thing that was happening in there, you have the dialogue between those two guys, Meliboas and Titerus. Meliboas has lost his farm. He is going to be pushed into exile. That will continue, that motif, we call it the exile motif, which comes back to Virgil's first eclogue, will continue for you know well over a thousand years in, in uh, Western literature. Um, so... The same thing is happening here. The speaker of Cookham is also um, developing this environmental consciousness, the same thing that Meliboas has. But there's a twist here I'll get to in the next slide. But the idea here is, remember, Meliboas develops an environmental consciousness, tries to communicate it to his friends, Titerus. Titerus doesn't get it. Here, according to Amelia Lanyard, this group of women who are who are this homosocial group living on this estate, Cookham estate, are now being put into exile. 
what happened with that, by the way? And well, let me give you the next slide and then I'll tell you what happened. It'll make more sense. This is one of the first, maybe the first example of Virgil's exile motif being applied to women. So Meliboas is a guy being kicked off his farm. Every time that this exile motif comes up again, men are going to be right about how they're exiled. Anybody exiled is going to be using the motif. It's always the same thing. Male writers writing about men being exiled. It's the thing. This is new. The exile motif being used by a woman to talk about how a group of women are being put into exile. And moreover, it's, it's astonishing because as you know, Lanyard makes clear here, this happens all the time. And so what physically happens here is that the estate wasn't actually owned by Clifford's family. Clifford's brother had leased it from the crown, from the royalty. And he decides for reasons that we don't know to not um, take up the lease. So he'll, he's, you know, he's, he's rented the estate and he's decided not to rent it anymore. And that's his decision, right? He's the one who controls the wealth here. He's the one who decides to do it. And this group of women who've actually been living there are now going to be exiled. This is not their decision. This is no different, as Lanyard argues here, and I think she's right, this is no different that, than when Caesar tells Meliboas he has to leave his farm, Clifford's brother is saying to Margaret Clifford, you have to leave with all your friends, you're gonna be put into exile. And, and you know, she's just really perceptive in, in seeing how this functions, yeah. And we also know, by the way, and this is something not to, to be dismissed, is that this dynamic here it's so is, is very common in the era. So we're going to see it again with um, Ben Johnson's to Penshurst. What I mean by that is, in that case, a guy owned the Penshurst estate, but um, his name is Robert Sidney. He spends all his time in London. He likes to be in London. It's got lots of diversions, lots of fun things to do, but he has this estate in the country. So who takes care of that estate? Well, we actually know in Johnson, in Robert Sidney's case, because there are letters back and forth with his wife, his wife ran the estate. His wife took care of negotiating with the farmers that was, you know, the ground was leased to and all the running of it while Robert Sidney was away. So we have every reason to think the same thing is happening here, and that is Margaret Clifford is taking care of this place. And that's going to be very important in a minute when we get to stewardship. But she is taking care of this place. This group of women are there taking care of the place, and there's no man there. Why? Because Clifford's brother is absent. Where is he? We don't know exactly, but very likely he's in London um, having fun. So... Lanier uses the exile motif, and again, she's she's reading straight from, I mean, literally, she's reading from Virgil's first eclogue, and she's trying to develop, she's trying to communicate this sense of environmental consciousness, where the landscape moves forward, sort of appears to her. Remember, that's what it does with Meliboas. Meliboas sees the uh, significance of the land only when he lost it. So I, I gave the example, it's like, 1969, people lived here in Santa Barbara. They, yeah, they knew they had an ocean and a beach, but only when that beach was devastated and harmed did they get a sense of environmental consciousness. Lanyard has it here. When placing its pleasures in your heart, cook them with draws. So this group of women, including Amelia Lanyard, who's there with her friend Margaret Clifford, um, lived there, they appreciated it, they liked it, but suddenly when they realized that they're gonna be exiled, just like Meliboas in Virgil's first eclogue, they develop a sense of environmental consciousness. Suddenly it just pops up in relief for them. And again, ever since Virgil, people have been doing this in literature, but they almost always have been men talking about men. This is women talking about, a woman talking about women. Um, just to be clear, it's it's a transitional text, so I don't want to like give the idea that Amelia Lander resolves every environmental problem and comes up with completely totally modern thinking. Um, it is anthropomorphic. Why? It takes the shape, the state takes the form of a human being. How? Well, hills, veils, and woods, as if on bended knee. So 
yeah, hills and valleys and woods don't have knees, you know, and and the only creature that bends on knees is a human being, you know, it bows down, it's bend at knee. Um, so it's acting like a human being, it's anthropomorphic, but also anthropocentric because why is, why are these hills, valleys, and woods kneeling down uh, other than to say that they, you know, um, um, are deferential or submissive to um, the women who have this estate. So yeah, it is anthropomorphic. We've seen both anthropomorphic and anthropocentrism before in the course, but here it's it's still alive and well with this particular text. So um, it's actually, and this is what's so interesting, described as dying without human tending. So the argument made here, and it's a it's a striking one, and it's, it'll become very important in Christian thinking environmentally in the future is that this estate is taken care of by this group of women. And they are, throughout the text, Amelia Lanier makes clear, they are really worried about something. And to their credit, it's not anthropocentric in the sense that they're not worried what's going to happen to them. So it could have been, this whole text could have been, oh, woe is us, where will we go? What's going to happen to us? You know, we don't know. That's not this text. In this text, they are worried what will happen to the estate, what will happen to this land. So Margaret Clifford has been such a good steward of this place. She's been caring for it. And we know that it, was, it probably was the case that she did this rather than her brother. She made sure that it was a healthy, fertile, fecund, wonderful environment. That was her job. She took it very seriously. The group of women there seemed to all be involved with this. And then the question is, if we leave, what will happen to this place? Who is going to take care of it when we're not here? Are they going to be as careful as we were, concerned as we were about the place? Will they care about it? Will they be, and here's the important word, and I'll get to the significance of it in a minute, will they be good stewards? as these women have been good stewards. And the steward just means someone who's entrusted to take care of something. So let me jump. Lanyard's environmentalism is a form of Christian stewardship. I've argued, I think people bought it, it may be the first major instance of Christian stewardship in the West. And it's coming from Amelia Lanyard. And what is this about? It means that, and she, at least in this text as a Christian, um, she argues that after the fall, God says, you have dominion over the earth. An interpretation that so many people had of that was, we could do whatever we want. I said, I gave the analogy of it's like, it's like a hotel room. You know, you can trash the place. Why? Because you're going to be teleported off and get to be heaven in heaven with God. The earth doesn't matter. Amelia Lanyard says, no, you've interpreted that entirely wrong. God has given us the earth to take care of, to be stewards of. We are supposed to take care of the planet. That's what God wants us to do. And if we don't do a good job of it, God is going to be very angry at us for not having taken care of the earth. It's a fascinating argument. People will come up, people will get on this bandwagon in the next 400 years. And most notably, the two major, I, th I think I would say the two, two most prominent Christian environmentalists, that would be the current Pope, Pope Francis and Al Gore, both major, you know, believers in Christianity, faithful, obviously, the Pope, but they both are in the Christian stewardship tradition. If you read the Pope's, he has two statements now, he just made a more recent statement, but before that, he had an encyclical on climate change, and the whole thing is Christian stewardship. His whole argument that both Pope makes and Al Gore makes is, as Christians, God wants us to take care of the earth. And the Pope says it again and again, we're doing a really bad job of it. And the Pope doesn't mince words. And the most recent one, he comes right out and says, and the wealthy countries, and he's, he's totally thinking about the US here, pretty much shows his hand. The wealthy countries are the worst. They are doing the least to take care of the planet. Our obligation as Christians, he says, is to be good, 
be good stewards, and we're not doing it. Anyhow, you see why that's so important environmentally. If, if you know, if, if you're Christian and whatever you're, um, you know, Jewish or um, Muslim, you may be in this tradition, and you may have thought, well, that's the only way to interpret what happens in um, Genesis. It isn't. Before before this, people were interpreting it in another way. There are still people interpreting it environmentally unsound way. But thanks to Amelia Lanier and those that come after her who develop it, we have this new approach that um, suggests that you know this belief system um, you know is not in conflict with environmentalism. There's a way that we can care for the planet. That we that stewardship is actually mandated by God. So um, that's my last slide on Amelia Lanyer, but incredibly important for all those reasons. We could we could easily have a whole course on her and it would be wonderful to do it, but we're doing a survey here. Um, but if you get a chance to um, look into her further. So Ben Johnson writes another country estate poem called To Penshurst. You can see, um, I said Amelia Lanyer wrote hers in 1611. Johnson publishes his in 1616. Lanyer won't publish hers till later. So she, she really beats him to the punch by, um, by five years. Just so you know who Johnson, Ben Johnson is, he's a playwright. And many people in this period know William Shakespeare. Well, William Shakespeare had um, playwrights on either side that kind of competed with him. So the first is Christopher Marlowe. Before Shakespeare was on the scene, the number one playwright in England was Christopher Marlowe. Shakespeare's this young up and coming guy. His job, his his mission in life is to be better than Christopher Marlowe. I think most people would probably agree that he was, but that's a matter of opinion. But at the end of Shakespeare's career, he has another guy doing the very same thing, sort of, you know, nipping at his heels, and that will be Ben Jonson. So Ben Jonson, an incredibly important playwright. You may not know him because Shakespeare kind of overshadows both Marlowe and Jonson, but they um, both important. Jonson also writes something called a court mask, just so you know. So plays, so plays at this time, and if you've ever been to England, you can still go today to the Globe Theater and you can watch a Shakespeare performance. They were meant for anyone. And I think if you pay, I think it's 10 bucks now, you can see a Shakespeare performance, but you have to be something called a groundling. You have to stand on the ground. You don't get a seat and you can watch it. And it's sort of like, I would say it's a cheap seat, but it's not even a seat. It's so cheap. But these plays were for everyone. Um, court masks were incredibly elaborate things with all sorts of special effects. They would have chariots of fire going across the stage and all, and it was all done with ropes and pulleys and things. Um, and it was just meant for like royalty. And um, the king would commission directly Ben Johnson to write things. And if he had like ambassadors or royalty from another country, he would show one of Johnson's amazing um, plays. So Johnson is very much a connected guy, just so you have some idea who he is, um, biography. It's called a country house poem, but it's really a country estate poem. And you're gonna see here directly, it seems like it's talking about the house, but it's not. And it's very clever on Johnson's part. Um, but the focus clearly very quickly shifts from the house to the surroundings, the estate, the environment. And remember, that's that's the whole thing for um, the description of Cookham. That's all Lanyard cares about is the environment. And arguably, that's all Johnson really cares about here too, although there's an allusion to, um, to houses, and we'll, we'll get to that directly. So what Johnson is critical of at the time would be called prodigy houses. You know them today because they're alive and well. And in fact, in the 21st, actually starting like 1980s, they had a resurgence with something called McMansions. So these are large houses that are designed to prove that the person who owns them is wealthy. Um, in, I think a McMansion technically has to be 4,000 square feet. So houses you may have known have grown in the United States. So right after the Second World War, the average house was under 1,000 square feet. 
It's actually grown now. The average house in the United States now is 2,700 square feet, 2.7 times larger with a much larger climate footprint as a consequence, which obviously is a problem. But a McMansion is technically, I think, 4,000 feet and above. And like 20% of all houses, one in five houses built in the US now is a McMansion. You might think that they are new. And again, it's kind of a phenomenon that comes on the scene in the 1980s in the US, but they go back um, at least 400 years. So Johnson is talking about it here. So these are the first four lines of Johnson's poems to Penshurst. Thou art not Penshurst, built to envious show of touch or marble, nor canst thou boast a row of polished columns or a roof of gold. Thou, thou hast no lantern whereof tales are told. So what's this about? First, he's addressing the house here. He's talking about the Penshurst house, not the, the estate, but the house. And he's saying, you are not a McMansion. You are not a prodigy house. Why? Because you are not built to envy a show. So right off the bat, he's, he's saying, why are people building prodigy houses? Johnson has a theory, and he's calling them out. They're built for envy a show. They're built so that people feel envious of them. They're built so you drive through that neighborhood and you think, oh, gee, I live in a small house or I live in an apartment. I feel envy toward that person. I'm jealous of the house they had. And Johnson said, for, I mean, right off the bat, that's, that's a really bad reason to be building a house, to be doing anything, to make people feel envious and jealous and feel bad about themselves. And yet Johnson says, that's exactly what these houses are being built for. And, and we know that historically what's happening in this period is that the wealth in England had traditionally been like with landed gentry. This is ancestral wealth. If you've seen like um, Pride and Prejudice or read the book or seen one of the films, like, you know, Mr. Darcy is that. He's got wealth handed down from generation to generation. But in this period, this is the beginning of proto-capitalism, the beginning of capitalism. You have like wealthy individuals accruing wealth very quickly. They're doing it through trade, through the colonial enterprise. They're doing it through proto-industrial practices that will lead to the Industrial Revolution. And these people are getting lots of money. They, they're nouveau riche. They haven't had money before. They don't have, you know, a claim to wealth that goes back 10 generations. So they want to show everyone they're wealthy. So they build a big house. It's, it's kind of the same reason many McMansions are built today. Um, what are you? And now he's very specific. You're not like these houses. And he's he's describing the houses by saying what Penshurst is not. They're not made of touch or marble. So I'm going to show you a picture of one in a minute where, you know, they had, had literal marble columns out front. We don't do that today, but McDanchins still have important marble like on countertops and floors and things like that. Um, nor canst thou boast a row of polished pillars. So these houses are being built in a neoclassical style. So they have columns out front to look like, like, a, like a Greek temple or Roman temple or a roof of gold. And this is an actual accurate reference. So people who want to build a house for envious show now use like all sorts of expensive material. Back then, they were actually putting gold on the roof. They actually would get um, very, very, very thin gold that's beat out and make it into tiles to put it on the roof. Just so that you know when you walk by or drive by in your carriage that these people are incredibly wealthy. They're so wealthy, they, have, they, can, they can put gold on the roof of their houses. And um, thou hast no lantern whereof tales are told. You have to know the, the period to know this, but what happens in this period is glass is suddenly being made in larger sizes than ever before. It's a technical thing. So you may know if you've seen like typical windows in older houses, it has like, you know, those little panes. That's because glass traditionally had to be built by uh, blowing a bottle, like a wine bottle, when it was still hot, cutting it and unfolding it. So if, imagine if you could unfold a wine bottle, you'd get a piece of glass that big. That was about as big as you could do it. In this period, they're getting a technology to make it larger, and they're having larger expanses and larger windows. So just to let everyone in the community know that you're incredible incredibly wealthy, these houses would be built with pillar, with um, uh, turrets on the side, and it'd be glass at the top, and they'd have a lamp in it burning all night long, so that everyone miles away could see that's where that house was, because it has this sort of like uh, lighthouse there burning all the time. Um, no doubt, by the way, burning um, 
whale oil to, to do that. So, but remember, Johnson is saying, Penshurst is not like that. These are the incredibly wealthy, home, the homes of incredibly wealthy, incredibly insecure people. And Johnson is saying, Penshurst is not like that. Um, here's the problem from an environmental point of view, and Johnson nails it here, because Penshurst joist in better marks of air of wood of water. And what he's saying here is, well, let me give you a little context. Penshurst is about 20 miles south of London. And at the time, as I mentioned before in lecture nine, there's a massive deforestation that's taken uh, part uh, across England. Where there are still forests nearby London, they are incredibly valuable. So, if you're a person who comes into a lot of money through you know, trade, the colonial project, you take that money and you buy like an older estate. And what's the first thing you do? You cut down all the wood and sell it. Why? Because from the year 1500 to 1620, the cost of wood goes up 700%. It's, it's one of the fastest large commodity growths ever in the West. And you could make a fortune just by deforesting your property. When you do that, though, you, you destroy the ecosystem there. But Penshurst joys in better marks of air, of wood, of water, because none of that has happened. This is kind of a pristine environment, at least in the sense it's not been modified in the last few generations. So here's what to imagine. Imagine you pass one, you come to one of these trophy houses, and you see it. And it has a gold roof and this turret and columns and marble and all. And you'd be like, wow, that's, am that's amazing. I'm astonished by it. Then you would look at the estate and the estate would look horrible. It's been deforested. It's just, it's, it's life is, you know, nowhere near as much diversity of uh, life there and all. The estate would look horrible, but that's okay because you're supposed to just look at that trophy house. Here, Johnson is saying, but look at Penshurst. Okay, it's not a very um, fancy house. It's not super big. It doesn't have marble. It doesn't have gold on the roof. It doesn't have a lighted turret. But stop looking at the house. And that's why he encourages you not to look at it. So he starts, Penshurst, thou or not. You never hear a description of the house. Instead, he says, I don't, I'm not focusing on the house. Let's look at the environment surrounding it, looking at the estate. And the estate is what the whole poem is about, and it's an absolute explosion of life. Um, it's just remarkable. There couldn't be a bigger contrast to those estates surrounding the, um, the McMansions, the prodigy houses. So just to give you an idea, this is probably the, the most lavish of all prodigy houses in England, the period, is Hampton Court, which is a royal dwelling. Um, this is... Yeah, this is this is off the hook for a McMansion. Um, notice also the carefully cultivated landscape. You can see it better here. Those trees are actually being cut into a topiary form. So you're seeing, and we're going to see this directly with Andrew Marvell, a real anxiety over um, changing the environment with things like that. Um, grounds here, just a little side note. Um, you may wonder why we have so much grass in the sense of lawns in the United States, turf grass. Well, this period, people wanted to make the estates look amazing. So after you cut down all the trees, you put these uh, huge lawns in, and that became a signifier of wealth and continues today. A third. So if you wonder, like, what's the largest crop in the U.S., people might think it's like um, corn, which is huge, number two. But three times as much um, in size is turf grass. That's what we grow. We use more, um, you know, we use more fossil fuel derived fertilizers, more pesticides, more herbicides on lawns than we do on any agricultural project. So, and why? It's the same thing to prove that you are wealthy. But, um, and again, notice the carefully crafted landscape. So this is actually Penshurst. You can go there today. If you ever go to London, um, I suggest you take a day trip outside, and this is it. And this picture pretty much makes Johnson's argument in the sense that there's the house, but the house is not what's amazing about this picture. Sure, it's a nice enough house. It's not super large like Hampton Court, but it's all about the environment. Look, that's all old growth forests surrounding it. There's some grass and all, 
but you know it's it's used agriculturally to to raise these sheep it's meant to be about the land this picture is about the landscape i would argue rather than about the house itself um what a contrast to to hampton court so in some sense why this is an important text is to Penshurst will anticipate Henry David Thoreau's Walden, which we're going to read part of. And Thoreau had read Penshurst. Um, the Penshurst house is going to be a lot more opulent than Thoreau's cabin. And I'll, I'll show you an example. I'll show you a picture of Thoreau's cabin so you know. Um, what's happening here is that Johnson is hyperbolically saying that Penshurst is environmentally perfect, but it's not. It's the it's the home of a wealthy person, um, would have been a very wealthy person at the time. But Thoreau is going to read that and actually try to enact a really environmentally sound house. So this is why you know Penshurst is important because it suggests that maybe we should be thinking more about the environment than about the houses in which we live. And what will happen with Thoreau, Thoreau says, okay, let's do that, seri let's seriously think about that. And he will actually create a house that to him is as environmentally sound as possible that protects the environment as much as possible. So we can see this here with, um, this again is Penshurst, but this is the back of it. The front actually, looks a lot more like Hampton Court. So I showed you the first picture um, because I wanted to make Johnson's argument, but if you're a detractor, you could say, but yeah, but that's not really the way that Johnson describes it. It looks kind of like a prodigy house in a certain way. But if you want it to, to make a house that really was the way that Johnson describes, this is what Henry David Thoreau does. It's 10 by 15 feet. This is a reproduction of his house. It's, um, yeah, about the size of a garden shed. Um, that was a reproduction there. And this is where we, uh, 1945, an archaeologist actually discovered the site. That's where Walden, the, the cabin was. And this is what it looks like inside. When we read it, you'll see the significance. He has um, three chairs so he can have visitors. He has a bed, he has a stove, he has a desk, and um, that's about all he needs. Oh, he has a table. Um, so, yeah. A little more about Penshurst and the significance of what's going on here. Remember the first lecture I, um, I um, talked about that antiquated song now i guess it's like 20 years old nickelback's rock star and you know it has that that cringe line i want a bathroom so big i can play baseball in it the idea that i want mcmansion i want the biggest mcmansion i want a mcmansion with a, a bathroom so big like it to be as big as this room you could play baseball in it um that excessive consumerism was you know already an ideal in English, England 400 years ago. And that's because capitalism is really taking off. The colonial project is taking off. Some people are getting a ton of money and they wanna show you their money. Why? So that you'll envy them and think they're great. But what's interesting is there are already people on the scene, Ben Johnson would be another, would be one of them that's going to be critical of that that's going to say that's a problem. That attitude that we see everywhere is a problem. Um, you know, the planet itself is being consumed by all this. That's a problem. And the estate itself would have been consumed by it. Um, but again, I just want to be clear, Johnson lives a pretty opulent life himself. Um, so it's not really suggesting radical lifestyle changes. Thoreau will. I mean, if you go live in a, um, you know, a garden shed, that's a pretty radical lifestyle change. But he is doing this in, in a knee-jerk response to what's beginning to emerge as a consumerist culture. If you wonder where consumerism begins in the U.S., you might think it began with the Industrial Revolution or after the Second World War or something. There are big spikes in it there for different reasons, but it really goes back further. Um, and that then gives birth to responses like Ben Johnson or specifically to the you know consumerism being made possible and fostered by the Industrial Revolution with Henry David Thoreau's uh, Walden. But if you want to go back to the beginning, 
here we are at the beginning of it. Um, we know that that um, through a red Penshurst and other country estate poems, he probably didn't read Amelia Lanyard, by the way, which is another little postscript to Lanyard, in that Lanyard was basically ignored for 400 years, almost. It's only in the 1980s that scholars discover her, and literally she's buried in you know the Bodian Library, and they were able to 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 dig this out and find out this incredible thinker that um, was just ignored. Um, not so today, though. Um, it's modern environmental consciousness that Johnson is exploring here, and this is how he's he's different than Amelia Lanyard. So remember, Virgil's exploring the emergence of environmental consciousness, right? Melibos is kicked off of his farm, and as a consequence, he develops an environmental consciousness. He tries to communicate that to uh, his friend Titerus. Um, But Johnson has, has stumbled into modern environmental consciousness, or deliberately starts drafting it, because it's not the person who's changing scenes. It's not a person who's exiled and moving away. And that's what it is in Amelia Lanyard's description of Cookham. But here, the landscape is changing. The environment is changing. The environment is being harmed. How is it being harmed? By the deforestation, by all the overfishing and all this described in the text. And that's where Ben Johnson says the environmental consciousness comes from. In other words, you can stay right where you are and look over at your neighbor's estate, which for hundreds of years had been old growth forest, and now that's all being cut down and destroyed, and now you develop an environmental consciousness. Ben Johnson has the beginning of an environmental consciousness in the West, and he is now going to try to communicate that to us. And he actually has um, a solution to it, too, which is, and it's so striking because here's the beginning of consumer culture in the West, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but I mean, the, the real pickup of it is happening here. And his solution is simple, consume less. That's part of the reason we watched minimalism and we'll, the uh, documentary, and we'll see that more with Thoreau too, that the answer to consumerism is consume less. And uh, it's certainly Ben Johnson's answer. Even though he's not really practicing what he's preaching, Thoreau would practice what he preached. Um, Johnson's poem and you can see this immediately directs us from the very opening, thou art not Penshurst, to the environmental de devastation and the cause of it too. So it's not like he just says, oh, look, this estate, it used to be beautiful, but now all the trees are cut down, it's overfished, it's dying. Well, you might say, but what caused that? Well, you won't, you wouldn't ask that if you read this poem because the very first lines give the cause. All that was done, all that was done to take those resources and use them to build a house. Not that the house is some massive log cabin um, with all that wood, but all that wood was sold for money, which in turn could bring in things like imported marble from Italy and all, which would have been horrifically expensive at the time. Um, but that's that's the cause of the problem. And if you think about it, Johnson has really tapped into the problem of the 20 of the you know will come subsequently generate decades and centuries is why do we have the problem that we have environmentally is it just population of the planet no it's it's not it's also the way we consume like certain people in the united states consume 200 times more uh, resources of the planet than the average person on the planet. And Johnson is already seeing the beginning of that group of people um, with like Cardassian kind of wealth, and he's just, you know, laying into it as a problem. Um, in some sense, this work is kind of anti-pastoral. So remember I showed you those photographs, Ed Bertinsky, who does things like look at, you know, um, ships run aground that are being cut up for the metal and, and all sorts of environmental devastation. Um, it's pastoral. But instead of turning away from the problem, he's looking squarely at it. And so is Johnson. And that's why it's a different kind of pastoral than the sort of conventional pastoral that we've seen before. So, yeah. Um, the way that he imagines Penshurst, the way that Johnson does, would be something like this. This is um, Frank Lloyd Wright's iconic house at Falling Water, Pennsylvania, built in the 1930s. It's been argued, um, I don't know that I argue with it, that it's the, um, the, the greatest American residential architecture, full stop. But 
This is kind of like the picture I showed you of to Penshurst. It's meant to fit into its environment. It's made of stone, yes, but the stone is actually quarried from this area here. So these stones that the house is built of are the same is the same stone here. It's like if you see some homes in Santa Barbara are made of this sort of um, sort of sandy color sandstone. Well, that's locally um, that's local stone. But other people will bring in granite, which is not from Santa Barbara. But here, Johnson is trying to make something fit into the um, into the environment here. It's, it's kind of like this, maybe a better example is a, is a stone wall. This is something that Andy Goldsworthy might have done, although he didn't do this one, where the stones are local here. It's made to make you think about where they came from. This is made to look half natural in the sense of untouched, but half artificial in the sense that someone made it. So um, it's gesturing to the um, environment too. Um, it's kind of making it, the house itself is kind of making a pastoral gesture, according to Johnson, in that looking at the house, you, you don't look at the house, you look away, you look at the environment. Johnson would say the function of the house is to make you look at the environment, to think about the environment. The function of a McMansion is to make you think about the house. And this is the opposite. It's to defer attention away, to gesture away to the environment surrounding it. Um, yeah, so that's what Penshurst is doing. It's making a gesture toward the pristine environment rather than the house itself, at least as Johnson imagines. And again, in reality, it, it certainly wasn't that um, pristine of a, of a place. But if you think about it, and Henry David Thoreau did think about it, you can imagine what a house at peace with the environment might be like. So um, Shakespeare, but before we do Shakespeare, let's do an uh, eye clicker and start it here. Did you find the Shakespeare reading boring? I'm not sure if you've read it yet, but uh, a little boring. Not done all the reading. I'll jump it now. So yeah, a little boring, but not too. Um, of all the early modern and uh, almost an equal amount of people haven't read it yet. Shakespeare, if you're, if you're interested in early modern literature, um, now people are all leaving because we just did two of the three um, polls. Um, and yet, and arguably what's coming up is some of the most interesting since Shakespeare is kind of an interesting guy. So we're gonna talk about Shakespeare next. So um, as you'd like it, is if you haven't read it, it's set in a forest, a wooded area called the Forest of Arden. It's an actual place in Warwickshire, England. More people are leaving, I'm so, so disappointed. Um, it's actually a place that you can still visit today. And if you were in England, this is a, I said more people are leaving, not more people leave. It was meant to be a description, not an imperative telling you to leave. Uh, okay, so this is why I should actually put the, um, put a larger span in between the um, eye clicker poles and people wouldn't do this. But anyhow, if you were in England at the time and you lived in England and you thought, well, where's the most like sort of wild place in England, the most wilderness, sort of like Yosemite or something, at the time you would have thought the Forest of Arden. And this is a picture of it. Apologies, this is the only uh, royally free, uh, best royally pi uh, free picture I could have could get, but also it looked like this as well. And this should explain something as we go through it here. The fact that there's an actual shepherd who lives here um, is because it wouldn't have been entirely untouched by human beings. There would have been deforestation uh, happening. Uh, so Shakespeare knows that the forest of Arden is going to be perceived kind of like a locus aminus among his audience. So, what he wants to do, and this is what's so clever about him here, and Shakespeare is clever here, aside from the way I kind of maligned him with what he did to Amelia Lanyard, if she is the dark lady, here he's clever. He wants to say that the view we have of something like the Forest of Arden is something we bring to it. So it's not objectively a locus aminus. It's not objectively anything. The way we subjectively see it is what really matters. So let me explain that as we go through here. Um, first off, note that it is his most mature work, um, pastoral work. 
It's definitely a pastoral play, but he actually has the two gentlemen of Verona from like a decade earlier, where he does like a conventional pastoral. It's like a perfect locus aminus kind of thing. But here in this one, as you like it, Shakespeare really shows his um, his perceptiveness regarding this. It presents pastoral life from a variety of perspectives. So we're gonna see the first one is the Duke Senior, um, his perspective, and then we're going to see a range of other people. So what's really happening here is you have a bunch of people from the city that go to the Forest of Arden. Duke um, Senior and his party are one of the groups. And each one of these people are looking at the same forest and they're all seeing it differently. And this is Shakespeare's big insight here is the environment is what you think it is, what you bring to the table. And why pastoral is important, we're going to see right now with Duke Sr. And I won't read this whole thing, but here's a guy, his royalty, who's from court. He's not royal, but he's from court. Wealthy guy. He's out in the forest of Arden with a bunch of um, friends. And you realize, his, he says here, has that not old custom made this life more sweet than of painted pomp? This guy has read a lot of pastoral. And he says, if you look at it here, it's even better than pastoral descriptions, than painted pomp. It's wonderful here. And he says, the only thing that this has that is kind of bad is the fact that unlike the pastoral that we've read about from the Greek and Romans, which comes from a Mediterranean climate, not unlike Santa Barbara, here it's cold and you have winter, it's cold. And he has to do that because the Duke has to acknowledge that England gets cold, unlike you know Mediterranean um, climate. But then he even says, but even that's good because when I shiver and all, it makes me realize I'm alive. The cold is actually a good thing. And he finally says here, you know, in this life exempt from public haunts, find tongues and trees, brooks and running um, and books and running brooks. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into so quiet and sweet a style. So what he's basically saying, what, what Shakespeare is saying here, here's a guy who believes pastoral who's read a lot of pastoral, seen pastoral art, and all he knows is to see the place as pastoral. So he comes from the city, he thinks, well, if you go to the country, this is what it's going to be like, and he actually believes it. And Shakespeare is saying some people might actually believe it, and he's an example of it. Um, and he actually makes, Shakespeare is making a reference, if you remember, to the first couple lines of Virgil's first eclogue, under the greenwood tree. Um, He's clearly referencing, Shakespeare's doing it to let you know this guy's actually read pastoral. He's read Virgil's first eclogue. If you see this line here, come hither, come hither, come hither, um, that is um, um, Sappho. You remember the seventh century poem we had from Sappho? That's one of the reasons I gave it to you, because I know Shakespeare is going to be playing, uh, repeating it here. So the Duke is thoroughly believing pastoral. He's read it, believes it, and he thinks he's in a pastoral place. I won't read this whole passage here, but again, it's in the PDF. Um, it, Jacques is an interesting person in that he's also from the city, from the court, but he's very concerned about, um, let's see, um, we are here mere usurpers, tyrants, and what's worse, to fright the animals and to kill them upon their assigned place and native dwelling home. So what Jacques is, is, is kind of fascinating. Um, he's one of the first that we have in literature. He's basically an animal rights activist. And at this point in time, there is beginning to be a trend toward vegetarianism, toward not killing animals, and there are people who are articulating this view. Um, and Jacques is one of them. And he comes to the forest and he says, yeah, we are interlopers here. We do not belong here. We are not the native dwellers here. There are people who live, there are, there are beings who live here. This is their place, not ours. Who are they? They're the animals here. And, and we're stealing their place and the ends here, you know, and what's worse, you know, we frighten them and then we kill them right here. So and it's, it's sort of, um, a powerful colonial argument in a way, but extending it not just to human beings, but other beings as well, saying that here we've come, we are not the native dwellers here, we are we are colonizers. And what's worse, not only are we you know, stealing this place, we are um, killing the, um, the inhabitants of it here indiscriminately. Um, 
Then you have uh, Touchstone, and he's an interesting, he's, he's yet another perspective, and Shakespeare is trying to come up with a range of different perspectives, and he kind of is like weighing it back and forth. Truly shepherd, and respected as of itself, it's a good life, but in respect that it's a shepherd's life, it's not a good life. In respect that it's solitary, yeah, I really like that it's solitary, but in respect that it's private, it's a very vile life because there's no one around. Now, respect it's in the fields. It pleases me very much. I love the fields. It's beautiful here. But in respect, it is not the court. I find it tedious because it's just a bunch of fields. So Touchstone is trying to, in his own way, assess what he, where they are. He's trying to understand it. And he's weighing, he's kind of one of these people that makes like a list, like, should I like this place or not? And he's lining up both sides, trying to figure it out. So next perspective you have here um, Orlando. Orlando is another person from the city, from the court, and he's just arrived there. And, you know, um, he says that, you know, to his friend Adam, who's not well, I'm going to go get some food. You know, is this in this uncouth forest yield anything savage? I will either be food for it or bring it food for thee. So this would have shocked Jacques, right? Because Jacques's an animal rights activist. And Orlando says, yeah, I know you're not well, Adam. I'm going to go get something to eat. Either I'm going to get, you know, killed by some kind of creature here or it's going to be killed by me to make food. So his perception of the forest is um, savage. It's um, to use his word here. And that, that, that is a cringe word, but let me explain it further here. This is Orlando. As he's going out to look for food, he comes to the Duke's party, the Duke and his friends. And he, he's surprised because he draws his sword when he finds these people in the forest. And then he's surprised and says, speak you so gently, pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here. And therefore I put on the countenance of stern commandment. So he sees people in the forest. The first thing he does is pull out a sword because he assumes they are criminals. And this would yet be another view of a forest at the time. What is a forest? It's what's beyond the reach of law. So you've all heard the story of Robin Hood and all. Robin Hood is based on the fact that they that criminals lived in forests at this time. Why? Because police couldn't go out there and get them. And if you had to go through a forest to get somewhere, people found this enormously frightening because one, they're going to be wild animals. And that's the thing that Adam said in the slide before that they're afraid of. Or two, they're going to be going to be criminals out there. And he says, speak you so gently, what he's saying is, oh, wait, you speak like gentlemen. You are not criminals. You are, you know, not what I thought at all I would find here because I just assume that a forest is a scary, dangerous place with wild animals and, and you know, criminals. And you're not. So he says, and I, I blush at the end and I hide my sword. Let me put my sword away because now I know that you're, uh, you're nice people. Um, Corin. So here we have 2,000 years of Western pastoral and not one real shepherd until, kind of until, uh, Shakespeare comes out and has one here. Shepherd, Corin here is an actual shepherd. And what I mean by that, he is, he is an agricultural worker. He works for someone else. I am a shepherd to another man. In other words, I don't own my flock. I work for someone. I don't shear the fleece that I graze. In other words, I don't get to cut the sheep and sell the wool. I have to do all the work, but all the money gets made by someone else. And the person that is my master of a churlish disposition, they they wouldn't give you any money because these um, people that have come to him saying, we need, we need help. And Corin says, yeah, it looks like I own all this. I don't. I am just a very, very poor agricultural worker. And the fact is, that's what shepherds really were in the period. And he still, in this view, he has a heart of gold. And he says, but let me see what I can do. I'm going to try to help. And I understand my uh, owner is trying to sell the place. Maybe we can get something worked out. But it's fascinating because he works hard. He doesn't have any money. He's not a shepherd, you know, leaning on his staff, singing songs, life characterized by odium and not work. It's the reality of agricultural, of, of life in a time like this. So incredibly important. Um, it makes us aware, Shakespeare's point here, that we view the environment differently, that there can be all sorts of positions from overly idolizing it, like the Duke who's been influenced by pastoral literature, to someone like Corin who sees the reality of, of life there. Um, 
why this is important, and just the last couple slides will be done, is this is Shakespeare's insight is really helpful today. So you have someone who looks at the North Slope of Alaska. What do you see? You may see a beautiful, pristine wilderness, one of the most beautiful, amazing wildernesses in North America, or you could see it as the people who wanted to develop it into the so-called Willow Project, a site of you know uh, many millions of gallons of oil that could be extracted there. So other people will see it as not just to project it, you know, beautiful forest, but as their ancestral land, so the native people of that region. So it depends on who you are, the way you see things. And it's a great insight on Shakespeare's part because it matters so much. So there it is, last eye clicker poll. Um, yeah, have you given much thought to this question that Shakespeare wants you to think about? How do you view the environment? People are leaving before they see the answer to this. It's such an interesting question. Occasionally think about what the environment means to me. So I'm very happy that people answered the first two most. Okay, have a good weekend and see you Tuesday. Thanks.